ruin is an enormous decision. I mean, it sets that standard of things. There has to be some historical foundation for these, these infringements of the Second Amendment to be allowed. Much of what these states are trying to do, of course, there is no historical foundation for what they're trying to do. It, it's nonsensical, certainly not to the degree they're trying to do it. And I, I forget now if it was you who pointed this out on Twitter or, or, or the FPC um, Twitter account. Uh, but just because they're doing these things like the sensitive areas restrictions, they're doing them piecemeal, right? They're not saying an entire city, an entire county, an entire state, but they're, they're just, they're, they're Xing out places where you can carry so thoroughly that there's effectively nothing left. There's like one sidewalk somewhere where you can lawfully carry a gun. We, we would never accept that kind of infringement no, I, on I, any I, other yeah. enumerated constitutional right. It's ridiculous. You, yeah. ha you, you have a right to counsel. You have a right not to self-incriminate. Oh, those things don't exist unless you're in a store that has a sign saying that you have a right not to incriminate yourself. And it's even, uh, for example, in California's version, uh, even if you have, let's say you have a, a store that has a right uh, sign that says you can carry in here. If it's in a strip mall with a business that sells alcohol, guess what? The whole parking lot is off limits because that's what the law says. You can't carry in the parking lot of a place that serves alcohol, even if you're not drinking. It could be a restaurant that just serves beer and wine with dinner if you want it. Maybe you never drink. I know a couple of our plaintiffs never drink. And that's part of our argument is they can't even carry. They can't take their wives out to dinner uh, at a restaurant that serves alcohol, which they won't drink while they're carrying. They can't even enter the parking lot. So and, and by the way, the reason this eliminates your right to carry completely Let's say you, you just intend to go for a walk or you're just uh, traveling to a business, you know, is allowed. You, you literally have to map out your whole day. You'd have to take out a map before you go anywhere to make sure you don't break the law. Granted, there is the argument. Are you really likely to get caught? No, but we're talking about a worst case scenario here where some freak thing happens and you do get caught. Right. So uh, you'd have to map out your whole day. Uh, and plan exactly where you're going and make sure each place you park is allowed and there's no business that might, uh, a, a place that serves alcohol or a gym or, you know, there's there's a few different places where the entire parking lot is off limits. Uh, so it, it, for all practical purposes, it eliminates the right to carry. The point is to make it so difficult that people don't bother. So it's a feature, not a bug, as they say. Right. It's a deliberate chilling effect on the exercise yeah. of an enumerated constitutional right, which which should be repulsive yeah. <laughs> to, to any reasonable person. Um, and um, there was another point I was going to make and it flew out of my head. Oh, yeah. Uh, these are all booby traps yeah. now. Uh, they're booby traps. Uh, imagine any other enumerated right where they said, oh, no, you have the right. Don't worry about it. You have the right. It's OK. Uh, but if you take one misstep, it's a felony. And then you lose all your rights. And it's a it's a misstep that's invisible because you don't know whether you're you're stepping into a shopping mall for the first time. If they sell alcohol there, you'd have to survey the entire the entire structure to determine whether you're well, doing you something. Even, you wouldn't even step into that shopping mall unless it has a sign on the door saying you can carry in here. Because remember, all private businesses are off limits by default now unless they put up a sign, which in California, if you own a business, even if you are pro gun. Unless you're in one of the rural parts of California, you're not going to put up that sign because you're going to alienate most of your customers who, you know, are not fans of guns. Well, so, you only need one one Karen, right? One Karen comes yeah. to your store, sees the sign, and starts yelling about it. it it's not worth having anymore. Yeah, it's not. It can disrupt your whole business. So, and that's actually another aspect of our lawsuit is a First Amendment claim because this is compelled speech. You know, we have a couple business owners who are fine with people carrying in their business, but they don't want to put up the sign because it's going to be disruptive. They just they just want people to continue concealed carrying with their permits as they have been for years you know so uh and they they say they're uncomfortable with the sign and it, it, they don't want to carry the state's message because that's what this is so I, I can't help but think of the parallels to like the jim crow laws right or after the after the civil war and we have the 13th 14th 15th amendments and and we we tell the former slaves and their children, uh, hey, no, you, you have all the rights of every other American citizen. But by the way, you got to take this test before you can vote. Right. No, it, it essentially is uh, like, I mean, California does this all the time. Just this week, along with this carry ban law, they also passed an 11 percent additional excise tax on guns and ammunition. Um, so California, it's already expensive for us here out in California to buy guns. They're already the most expensive in the country. Any handgun or rifle you think of at a hundred or $200 to the price. And that's typically the California price. So now 11% on top of that for guns and ammo. I mean, it's, uh, it is like a poll tax essentially, because this is a constitutional right. Um, and it, it, they're just adding and adding to the cost. Again, this is all about, 
um, eliminating attacking gun culture. We just had a ruling in one of our cases yesterday in the Ninth Circuit where the uh, uh, Gavin Newsom passed a law that said you can't advertise guns to minors. Uh, he was very upset about the so-called JR-15 ad. It was a 22 rifle that looks like an AR-15 uh, that was uh, for kids. But of course, you, you can't buy a gun if you're a child. You need a parent to do it. But what this law did was it effectively killed youth shooting sports uh, in California because all these youth shooting sports are sponsored by gun companies. That's how they exist. You know, sure. the, there might be like a Sig Sauer ad or a or a, uh, a Ruger uh, banner at the event, and that's marketing guns to children, right? So those were all banned. Um, and, and we won yesterday because the Ninth Circuit said even under the looser standard of the commercial speech regulations, th this is unconstitutional. And Gavin Newsom threw a fit after. I don't know if you saw his statement on Twitter, but um, <laughs> he, uh, he he's very upset about it. So we're doing I'm our pretty best sure he here. has the, the same estrogen levels as the New Mexico <laughs> governor. I don't know if I can if I if I'll comment on that, but uh, yeah, it, it, he's, uh, he's. And of course, all of this is partly uh, a, a war against what we might call gun culture or Second Amendment culture in America. Right? They they attack gun shows, they attack gun advertising, they attack getting children involved with shooting sports. That's how I learned how to shoot as a kid: small bore rifle competition. Mm -hmm. And so people grow up without that, that tradition of shooting firearms, and then you have to see if they'll develop it as adults. But of course, in many of these states, the, the Second Amendment environment, even for adults, is extremely uh, negative, costly, difficult. Uh, they do everything in their power to make sure it's not easy or convenient for people to discover the, the enjoyment of uh, shooting firearms for hunting, for competition, for just personal pleasure. And it's really a culture war in the most literal sense of it. They, they see this facet of American culture and they just want to eliminate it. They want to abort it, essentially. So it, it never it's starts. A, it's a vicious culture war. You mentioned gun shows. That's another one of our cases, you know, the gun show ban in California. So it's, uh, it's, it, it is like we are constantly under siege. Uh, fortunately, thanks to Bruin, uh, the landscape has gotten better. Uh, we'll see how it holds up on appeal because... Thus far in Ninth Circuit history, whenever there's a pro-gun ruling, they end bank and reverse it, you know, every time. Even though end bank is rare and only granted in something like one or two percent of appeals, somehow every single pro, every time we get a good three judge panel and get a win, it gets reversed on end uh, bank. <laughs> so uh, we'll see if that continues in light of Bruin. And if it does, we'll see if the Supreme Court cares to get involved this time. Yeah, I've covered a number of those decisions where I'm, I'm always shocked, of course, somehow miraculously the dice get rolled and you get a three-judge appellate court yeah. panel that gives you a, a Second Amendment favorable ruling. And then a few months later, the en banc decision comes out and you read it and it's it's just word salad. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Uh, the three court decision made a lot of sense. It's very rigorous, very well scripted, very well reasoned. And then the en banc decision is basically uh, 50 pages of, well, we just don't like that outcome. So. We're, we're going to say it's it's reversed. Yeah, it's it's depressing. It's how it is. But again, hopefully that changes in light of Bruin.